Okay, um, it is Easter week, Holy Week. Uh, tomorrow's Easter, so I made a whole bunch of uh, art videos here. And I just recently did one called uh, Art of the Ancient Greeks because the Ancient Greeks are really a major uh, source of information for the founding of Christianity. Okay, um, and this lecture here today is going to be the Art of the Old Testament. And the Old Testament, by the way, is been mistranslated very different than a lot of people realize. Um, it's almost been rewritten. And so I say that because, you know, most priests, most pastors, they really don't know what they're talking about. And, you know, you don't want to argue about little things, but there's major big things that have happened with the translations of the Old Testament. And I don't want to get into that because that's a topic uh, for another day when there's a lot of time and I don't want to get into that kind of stuff. But what I am going to just tell you is there's a few points I think everybody should get out of the Old Testament. Okay, well, first of all, this is the Sistine Chapel ceiling as painted by Michelangelo in 1509. It's in the Vatican in Rome, the Sistine Chapel. And what's unique about the ceiling is it's almost entirely Old Testament. Um, you've got God separating the darkness from the light, you know, creating the waters and the land. Um, then he's got the creation of man with Adam. Uh, then he creates Eve. Then Adam and Eve, you know, fall to temptation. They're cast out of Eden. Then there's a couple things about Noah, the drunkenness of Noah. Okay. Um, on the far wall, when you walk in there, though, you'll see the Last Judgment. And there's Jesu Christu, okay, with Mary sitting next to him. All right. And so that is, of course, sort of New Testament and, you know, last days and all this other stuff, which <laughs> sadly seems highly relevant as well. Um, okay, here's just an overview of what's on the Sistine Chapel ceiling. You know, again, God creating the world, then the creation of man, the downfall, expulsion of Adam and Eve, the Noah story, the flood and whatnot, and then related material in the periphery there. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about the structure of the Bible just real fast here. The Bible is mostly Old Testament. The Old Testament is the bulk of the book. It's the bulk of the time, um, relatively little time dedicated to the New Testament. But the New Testament is by far the most important part of the Bible. A useful way to think of the Old Testament is it's all leading to the New Testament. And now people will fuss about the Old Testament. There's a few things you can get out of it. A lot of it's boring, rules, rules, rules. But there are some good things. There's some good ideas in Proverbs. Um, Genesis, there's a lot of useful stuff. It's good to read at least the first half of Genesis and more than that. Um, a good way to read the Bible is to listen to audio versions of it, and you can read along with it. You have to pick a translation you're comfortable reading. You know, David Scarby has uh, got a lot of audio translations. Another guy named, I'm sorry, Alexander Scarby. Uh, David Suket, and there's other ones, but that's just one way to energize yourself to read is listen to the audio while you read it. I like Scorby because he has the chapter and verse on the screen as he reads it. Um, but those are some of the important points. But I want to tell you is there's a lot more problems with mistranslation of the Old Testament than there is with the New Testament. New Testament is more simple and straightforward. The Old Testament, man, is there big disagreements. You start reading the commentary. One of the reasons why in my experience, most pastors and priests really don't know that much is because they tend to know just their own version of the religion. And they haven't read other points of view and other commentaries. And of course, they would say, well, why should I? Mine is the correct version or sect or whatever. But the reason why you would is because you get ideas from it. There's some really smart people that have spent a long time trying to understand the Bible. And they've written books about it and commentary about it. And I can assure you, they see the Old Testament very, very differently than most priests and pastors. Okay, And it, you know, it doesn't really matter, though, in the sense. In some ways it matters. In a big way it matters, really, for society. But in other ways it doesn't matter so much in terms of the New Testament is what it is. And all this stuff is leading up to it. And you can think of it that way. And here's examples of all the different translations, you know, and the different types, word for word, meaning for meaning, paraphrase, thought for thought. So all this means that there's going to be some disagreements on little parts, and there's going to be people who've manipulated the translations to promote what they want. Like the King James Version, uh, you know, as funded by King James, was to promote the importance of the church, which was run by him in England, okay? Um, so he wanted that, and he wanted to appoint the bishop so he could control everything. Okay, so there would be an emphasis on the organized church under his control. 
All right, things like that. All right, so here's God separating the dark from the light. These are, of course, Michelangelo's paintings on the Sistine Chapel ceiling. And here's my favorite painting of Adam and Eve. This one is by uh, Jan Bruegel and Peter Paul Rubens. And I've made this point plenty of times in my lectures. If man would just live like Adam and Eve, kind of simple, keep your indoor heating and plumbing, be so much more healthy. Almost all the modern stuff is bad for you. Okay, here is the creation of Adam, and it's kind of a cool painting And that God is encased in what looks like a brain. This is the temporal lobe, Sylvian Fisher right in here. Here's the frontal lobe. Here's the parietal lobe. Here's the occipital lobe back here. And God is, in a sense, bringing Eve, or the idea of Eve, to Adam if he perhaps constructed her out of his rib, so to speak. And this certainly does really look like a brain. And the foot hanging down here looks like the pituitary and the other foot hanging down here looks like the brain. Like this looks like the brain stem, you know, going into the cervical spinal cord. Um, and people have written articles about that. And here's sort of the the magic touch of life as Adam comes to life. And by the way, this is the most important painting in the history of the world um, because what it says is man is created in the image of God and therefore somewhat like God. He is both you know, part divine and part beast, but because he's part divine, he's entitled to natural rights. And as it says in the Declaration of Independence, and rights endowed by his creator to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Okay, um, that's important because the two competing views for society are this Bible Christian ethics versus um, what you would call atheistic Darwinism. And atheistic Darwinism has largely, as a religion, taken over uh, America and much of the West. And it's very bad for the individual. It's very bad for poor people, which means average people, because what it says is they're just talking primates, talking monkeys, and therefore they have no intrinsic rights unless given to them by the ruler, and they need to shut up and obey and do as they are told, and they have no rights, okay? And you know, they're not entitled to free speech or anything else. And people don't seem to understand that. They think, oh, you don't need religion for science. Science has nothing to do with religion. That is not true. And, you know, science, the modern scientific method was founded by the Catholic Church. If you study history, you will find that that is correct and obvious. And what I can tell you is modern so-called science is mostly a joke. It's mostly corporate advertising. Um, and, you know, the American uh, medical system actually hurts more patients, far more patients. It hurts far more patients than it helps because it's all based on making money and lies rather than telling the truth with real science, okay? Now, I wanted to show you this. This is, uh, you know, Milton. He was blind at the time that he dictated Paradise Lost uh, to his daughter, who, you know, transcribed it and wrote it out in 1667. And Milton's book is actually magnificent and beautiful, but what I would say is the Latinized version of his English is too hard to read. Um, this book I thought was really good by Joseph Lansara, uh, Milton's Paradise Lost in Plain English. If you read it in that version, and I read this version, I tried reading both of them. I had a hard time with the, the Latinized type of... Latin, you know, uses passive voice, and it was a long time ago, the 1600s, when Milton wrote it. So it's it rather difficult to read the Latinized English. It's English, but it's like Latin-like English, versus this was easy to read, and it was a very enjoyable book. Okay, so here's Michelangelo's Sistine Chapel ceiling again, and this is expulsion of Adam and Eve in paradise. They've taken the apple from the snake from Satan, and they are cast out of heaven. Okay. Okay, here's another version of this same painting by Thomas Cole. He's a magnificent story painter. He's a guy who painted Voyage of Life, like one of the greatest story paintings of all time. Um, Excuse me. And, um, you know, it's just great stuff. He also painted um, The Course of Empire, which is another magnificent painting based on the ideas of Giambattista Vico. Okay, now another guy I think it's good to know about is Northrop Frye. Northrop Frye wrote a book here called The Great Code of the Bible and Literature. And he's a big believer that everybody should read the Bible. He says, the Bible should be taught so early and so thoroughly that it sinks straight to the bottom of the mind where everything that comes along can settle on it. The Bible makes people way smarter. And there's been other people. I think one of the guys' name was Horace Greeley. He said, you can't enslave a Bible-reading people because it's fundamentally built into Christianity. Man is created in the image of God. All men are equal in the eyes of God. 
And, you know, once you start thinking that way, you're not going to go down the path of slavery. You're going to fight it. And it's the Christians that have, that, you know, got America to bounce out of slavery. It's the Christians who um, also helped free India. Uh, the ideas of Christianity helped free India from the British. Okay, and now here's something coming from Northrop Fry, and this is, this is like the main idea of his code of the Bible. What he basically said is, and this is very similar to Gian Battista, Gian Battista Vico's ideas of the course of empire and civilization, the course of civilization. So basically, you start out with a primitive people, and they're united to help each other. They have faith in their God. They are brave to do what they need to do to survive and to protect their group, whatever it might be. They are strongly uh, supportive and protective and nurturing of the family. They're very hardworking. They know the history of their people, okay? And they achieve a relative for humans, a relative utopia in terms of what is possible. The sort of summit of how happy and things can good things can be for people. They're never going to be perfect. There's always going to be some unfortunate events, but that's as good as it gets for humans. But then they start losing their faith, mocking their religion, becoming decadent and hedonistic becoming stupid in the sense of no or ignorant they don't no longer read their history no longer know their history um, and this by the way is characteristic of what happens to the groups in the Bible they sort of turn their back on God and then they go down um, like ancient Rome they became decadent didn't keep up their historical uh, trends and didn't respect their elders didn't respect sort of where they came from and they were conquered and they become stupid too the water's poison you know the water in rome is poison the word lead is plum is the scientific symbol for it like plum isn't because it was used for plumbing lead pipes and so they're getting lead from their water but you know look at it now in modern america the water's poison too typically it has fluoride in it which causes brain damage especially in young people and um, it also makes them docile and passive and accepts you know being unfairly treated in addition, the water's got a lot of aluminum in it. Another major neurotoxin, and it's got a bunch of estrogenic chemicals that feminize people, make them infertile. Aluminum also contributes to infertility. So there's no such thing as a gynocracy in the real world. They're feminizing society to make it ready to be enslaved. It's grooming to be enslaved, okay? And then the women are being told, oh, that being a housewife and a mother is, is being a low life and you want to go for your career. What they're doing is they're trying to trick them into not having baby while they simultaneously sterilize them as they go for these prolonged educations. And um, I think a lot of these women are going to end up with no kids or few kids and be sad and lonely about that. Okay, so anyways, uh, the society that's disunited, because too, like when you hear diversity is our strength, what that really means is the billionaires who run the world want you as divided as possible. And it's just basic stuff. You go back to Rome, Rome would want to conquer other territories and they would just try to divide the people. If they could, The more they could divide them, like get two adjacent cities to not get along and fight with each other, then each one of them is easy to conquer. And that's been known for a long time, the divide and conquer strategy. And you see it all the time. For example, England is a bigger country than Ireland. And England was united. So they go into Ireland where there's all these different chieftains fighting over little territories and they're not united at all. It's very easy for England to conquer Ireland in that setting. Something similar happened in Italy where the different city-states uh, were sort of fighting with each other, you know, Florence, Venice, Rome, Milan, and um, it made them easier to conquer by outsiders, okay? And look at Rome. Rome was sacked in 1527 by Charles V. It just really couldn't defend itself, okay? And so uh, people must be united. And like when I was growing up in America, I'm old enough to know, I'm 60, you know, it used to be we pledge allegiance, uh, we pledge allegiance to the God, one nation under God, okay? We saw ourselves as the God-fearing good people, the Christian people, versus we saw Russia as the godless evil empire, you know. Um, and that was a big supporting point. And it also used to be e pluribus unum, out of one many, you know, the melting pot of the United States. You know, you may have come from in such and such a place, your parents, but now you're an American, so you're all Americans. No hyphenated Americans like Theodore Roosevelt used to say. Um, but nowadays, America's totally divided into all these little factions. There's all these little holidays and months for this ethnic group, this ethnic group, this ethnic group, and people think it doesn't matter to say you're American. And I believe that's deliberately done by the billionaires who run the world because it's a way to divide everybody, make America weak and stupid. And they don't teach real history in school, and they de-Christianize the history. So, uh, and you know, people don't understand, when a country falls, it's not nice, it's brutal, okay? 
Outsiders come in, they conquer the country, many of the men are slain, okay, the women are, you know what, R-A-P, you know what, E-D on that word, okay, and then the population that's left over is enslaved, okay, that's what happens, that's what America is headed towards, and you know, all these dummies, low IQ dummies, they think, you know, oh, I'm joking, or I'm just, you know, no, I know exactly what I'm talking about, I've read tons and tons of history, tons and tons of religious stuff, and I can tell you, America is a perfect example. Just take problems related to the fall of Rome, related to the fall of Russia in the 1900s. It's obvious. All you have to do is just add to it modern technology, but that's what phase we are in. Basically, it's like a, you know, a com, you know, then you, then ist takeover of the United States. That's what we're living through, okay? And it's sad because we're headed towards being slaves, okay? I don't want to be a slave, you know. It's all right. Um, here is the painting of the flood by Michelangelo, and um, flood story, like I said, was a pretty uh, generalized thing. It wasn't just the Bible writing group uh, that wrote about the flood. It was also in Greek literature and the literature of other societies. Okay, so there was some type of big flood event. It's kind of funny. Ann Coulter, the author commentator, she says. You know, we don't see transitional forms in the fossil record like Darwin had predicted. Instead, we see a whole bunch of phyla, different categories, major categories of animals, all popping up in the Cambrian expansion about 650 million years ago, almost as if there was a big flood or something. So, and by the way, I, I was, I'm a straight-A student in uh, evolutionary biology at Stanford. I believe that mankind is created by God. It's just way too complicated. We've got 100 billion neurons in our brain connected to at least 500 billion glial cells, support cells, maybe as many as a lot more than that. Depends on what part of the brain you're in. And for them all to connect correctly, randomly, by chance, I'm not buying it. You know, like Lennox, the English guy, said, if somebody wrote your name in the beach, in the sand, you would know an intelligent person had written your name there, okay? Whatever your name is, five, ten letters. So how is it that the DNA uh, genome, 3.3 billion, 3.3 B as in billion base pairs, just randomly wrote itself? Where did that information come from? You know, a human devotes their entire life, the smartest humans there are. Okay, they devote their entire life, and they can figure out one thing and win a Nobel Prize for it. Okay, <laughs> so you think they figured it all out? Don't even kid yourself. We can barely describe the embryology development of the brain, yet alone understand it. All right. So, anyways, this is a painting called "Fallen Angels Sent to Hell" by John Martin. English painter. And the point I'm making is this is like the story of Paradise Lost. You know, Satan had a falling out with uh, God and he was sort of sent down into hell. Paradise Lost describes all this in very entertaining detail. And here's another painting by John, uh, John Martin. And this painting is called Pandemonium. Pan meaning all and demons, of course, demons. Okay. And so sort of Satan's reign in hell. The okay. Now here's Satan presiding over the infernal council. Um, you might call this a different type of world, you know what, uh, federation or something. All right, so anyways, <clears throat> here's Satan presiding over this infernal council. And one of the things, too, that's interesting to in the Bible is when you look at it closely, you ask yourself, is there even a hell? Now, I don't want to argue about it, but I'm saying there is major debate about that subject. Is there even a hell? Is there really a purgatory? Now, I don't want to get into the whole thing, but some people would even say, well, if Jesus really loves us, why would he send some people to hell? Why wouldn't he give them a second chance? Or, you know, the Catholic Church says they go through purgatory and they're purified. I'm not going to get into all of that, but I, what I just want you to know is you're never going to get complete resolution on some of these types of theological debates, and I don't think they're worth arguing about. There's more important things. And also, I don't think theology should really be just about you know, do you go to heaven and live happily ever after? It should also be about what's on earth. And there's always sort of an ongoing battle, if you will, between, you know, Christ and, you know, Christ's servants and Satan, okay? And it seems like the same thing is going on in the world. And I call it health heaven is all this stuff. Health hell is all this stuff. But there is really in real life also sort of a, a conflict between good and evil. And basically evil is smart and well-organized and pays attention to details, whereas good tends to be clueless, disorganized, not paying attention, often stupid, getting its butt kicked. So here's another painting of the war between heaven and hell. Okay, and there's, a, there's big things going on that almost no one knows about because you're not going to see this in the mainstream. You're only going to see this if you spend a little more time reading. 
For example, there's in Canada, there's some effort to maybe make the Bible illegal. That you know, if you if you speak out against, let's say, Drag Queen Story Day for children, some pastors have been arrested for this. There's uh, attempts being made to make it said that to quote the Bible on something that goes against anything that the lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, etc., queer community wants is hate speech. Okay, so what I see happening is this LGBTQ stuff is being over-promoted as a way to get rid of Christianity and as a way to get rid of the Christian family. Because once you get away from man creating them with a God, you start talking about atheistic Darwinism, why should anyone own their children? If the ruler owns everything and owns you, you're just a slave, you're just a talking monkey that the ruler owns, then why should you own your child? Okay? The, the billionaires that run the world, they like, you know, being in bed with children, okay? They want to lower the age of consent to at least 12 or younger, okay? This is not anything coming from me. This is all well known. It's all over the internet. You can read it yourself, okay? And there's been all this, you know, child, you know what, uh, trafficking, okay? Why do you th where do you think it comes from? It comes from persons who have lots of money who believe that, you know, atheistic Darwinism. Once you go to atheistic Darwinism, it's like Fyodor Dostoevsky, the Russian writer, said, if there is no God, then everything is permitted. And the person, then might is right with atheistic Darwin. So basically, whoever's got the power and the money can do whatever they please, and no one can really have a, a philosophical position to argue with that. Oh, you don't like it? Well, too bad. You don't have the power. There's nothing you can do. Might is right, so just shut up. That's how that works, okay? Um, and the typical things now, and this is in corporate America. Uh, basically, uh, employees said, you know, at this company here, Best Buy, they're not allowed to have a cross on their desk. They're not allowed to have a Bible on their desk. On the other hand, though, the, the rainbow flags, uh, for you know what, were encouraged. They were described as being appropriate for a person's desk at work, okay? In the employee hiring programs, they would not allow Caucasian people to apply for management jobs. And this wasn't one company. It was sort of somebody talked about it at Best Buy. McKinsey Incorporation was the one going around with all the management training programs. And they intentionally excluded uh, Caucasians because they said Caucasian privilege is a bad thing. And therefore, they were not allowed to go to management training, meaning that it's impossible for them to be promoted. And this is more of what I see as a targeting of a specific group in order to block them out of financial positions of money or power or success in the future because the goal is to reduce their numbers. So they want them, because people are less likely to have a kid if they're poor, so it's a way to make them as poor as possible so that they will be weak and they will not have children and their group can be gotten rid of, okay? So this is not like a friendly or a nice thing. You know, it's a common thing in corporations to pretend that this LGBTQ stuff is being highly moral and good. But the truth is, I don't think they even care about the people in the LGBTQ. I think they just see it as a useful way to once and for all get rid of Christianity. Whenever you want to establish total rule, a total rule, the modern word for slavery is communism, okay? What you want to do is get rid of all the religions, especially Christianity. They hate Christianity because it says all men are equal before the eyes of God. And they look back to the Declaration of Independence. They look back to the Constitution. That was done by a bunch of white Christian men, okay? So they want that group. That's the number one group scapegoated and designated for removal, okay? Because they see them as an opposition to slavery. And if you look at the you know, the Georgia's, you know what, stones. It's been written for a long time that the goal of the billionaires that run the whole world is to lower the world's population to 500 million. Right now it's about, I don't know, about 8.5 uh, billion. So that means over 90% of people have got to go, okay? Um, and that is in the works right now. If you're paying attention to events, everything is trending towards that. For example, there was an article just recently, a whole bunch of Small farms that were located in the state of Oregon were all shut down, they said, for the people's protection. No, they shut them down so the poor people wouldn't have any food except for what they buy from the big corporations, okay? That's not good, okay? And, you know, the you-know-what down south has opened up, flooding the country with people that do not have an interest in the traditions of this country, and that will be amenable to doing other things. And here's another example in Canada, you know, not that long ago, they burned down 81 churches due to this hoax to get people mad at the churches. And so this sort of thing, this is very typical. If you look at a typical, you know, takeover, like let's say of Russia uh, in the early 1900s, this is all typical stuff. 
destroy the food supply, starve the people, uh, burn down the churches, uh, label whatever group has the most ability to not want to be taken over and enslaved, label, label them as evil, scapegoat them, get rid of them first, and then get rid of all the rest of the chumps, okay? This is all standard stuff, and it's happening um, very rapidly in the United States, and hopefully it's not going to be successful, but right now it's looking pretty darn successful. I see the trend towards slavery growing every year. Okay, here's another painting uh, with Archang Arch Archangel Michael, Archangel Michael subduing Satan in this picture by Luca Giordano. Okay. Now here is a painting of separation of the Red Sea, and this was Moses, you know, leading uh, his population out of Egypt and their slavery in Egypt, and then the Ten Commandments. Well, first of all, the burning bush spoke to him. God spoke to him from the burning bush. Then he was given the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments are a way that people can get along with each other. Okay, They're good basic rules for society. Love thy God, because if you turn your back on God, he turns his back on you. Um, and then other rules, you know, don't steal from people, don't lie to people, don't hurt other people. It's all good basic stuff. And by the way, if you look at this picture, he looks a lot like Charlton Heston. These paintings were made for the movie Ten Commandments that was directed by Cecil B. DeMille, starring Charlton Heston. It's a magnificent movie. And the artist is Arnold Freiburg. He's a great artist. Um, <clears throat> the, probably the best religious artist of the 1900s. Okay, here is a painting of Jacob and Esau. So Jacob... He's kind of a red-headed guy, got real hairy arms, a bit of a hunter, a little bit thuggish and kind of coarse and vulgar. But he did some pretty stupid stuff. Jacob was his brother, and Jacob was smarter. Jacob was eating his soups and porridge. Let's just call it oatmeal porridge. And um, Esau traded his birthright for a bowl of porridge because he was hungry. I mean, stupid. And what I'm trying to say here is, Western civilization is the greatest civilization that has ever existed on this planet. All this multicultural diversity stuff is BS. There is no civilization outside of Western civilization that has produced so much beautiful music, classical music, folk music, and otherwise, that has produced so much beautiful art, so many good things, so much wonderful literature. And it's committing suicide, and it's basically accepting, you know, just being chumped, okay? It's being chumped into saying, you know, all this modern crap. You go to a movie theater, just say about 50 to 70 years ago, there were lots of beautiful movies. Look at movies like It's a Wonderful Life. Look at the movie Ten Commandments with Charles H Charlton Heston. Uh, movies like Quo Vadis. They're beautiful, and they're good, and they're kind, and they're right, and they're nice. Versus now you go to a movie theater, look at all the modern movies, they stink. They're low class, a bunch of beat music, special effects, violence, action scenes, you know, cheap SEX. It's just crap, okay? I, I haven't gone to a movie theater in over 20 years because it's all crap. Okay, um, now here's just a few more paintings from uh, the Old Testament. And a typical example of, you know, predicting... Jesu Christu and his, you know, death and resurrection. Jonah was in the belly of the whale for three days. Okay, pretty typical stuff here. Oops. All right, here's the Tower of Babel. When, you know, when societies um, stop being able to communicate effectively with each other and things just go into the garbage can. Um, We're almost done here. Uh, one of the best parts of uh, the Old Testament is the prodigal son. And so here's the prodigal son. He sort of rebelled against his parents and went off on his own and kind of was dissolute, drinking, fooling around with sleazy women. And then he ended up with a lousy job, you know, feeding the pigs and almost living with them. And he sort of learned his lesson. And uh, he reconciled with his family. And here he is coming back to his father. His father welcomes him in. You know, his other brother was a little jealous of him. Why does he get a big party when he comes in? And I've been good and loyal and working, and I don't get as much. But the father's like, he was lost, and now he's found. So let us just celebrate this. And Charles Dickens had said, it's the best story in the Old Testament. There's a great song version of The Prodigal Son by Keith Green. If you could just, you know, maybe I'll put the link into it. Keith Green's Prodigal Son, it's great. It's a long song, too, but it's great. It's the best song about The Prodigal Son. Here's a nice painting of it as well. 
Return of the Prodigal Son, this one by Pompeo Batone. Here's the song, Prodigal Son by Keith Green. Rembrandt's painting is kind of famous for the Prodigal Son's return, but these other paintings I just showed you, they're all better. That's why I didn't show you the Rembrandt painting. Okay, here is uh, the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, another thing that wouldn't be too popular from the old Bible. So I just wanted you to see that, these pictures, to get a sense of you know, a little quick, quick introduction to the art of the Old Testament. There's obviously lots more painting. We're not going to go into that, the focus of this. And a and couple things to remember, when a society turns their back on God, God turns his back on them, and they go down the tubes. Um, so, okay, I hope that was interesting or useful.